Hello and welcome to our latest helmet overview video. We've taken a look at some of the comments and critique from the last two weeks videos and we've made a few alterations to the structure so we can hopefully make the videos a bit more informative and easier to access going forwards. The video will be divided into the overview, location and context of the helmet, followed by the type, the construction and the materials used and finally a little bit of analysis on any unique elements. So let us know what you think in the comments below in order that we can continue to improve as we go. Also, look out for a combination trailer and channel roadmap video coming out sometime in the next week, covering the channel as a whole and outlining the plan of attack we have for our forthcoming material. Right, on with today's helmet. Today we're going to be looking at the August helmet, or Augusta Rorica helmet, found at the site of Augusta Rorica in Switzerland. Here we can see the location of August in modern day Switzerland, and here a map originally drawn by Hans Eren showing Augusta Rorica in the 4th century Roman world. The site today is both an archaeological area of interest and an open air museum available to the public. It is unclear exactly when the site was first colonised, but evidence suggests it was first settled in 44 BC by Lucius Munatius Plancus and fully colonised in 15 BC under the reign of Augustus following the turmoil of the civil war brought about as a result of Julius Caesar's death. Getting closer to our period of interest, by the turn of the 3rd century AD, Augusta Rorica had grown into a wealthy trading settlement, numbering approximately 20,000 people at its height, exporting various products, but predominantly smoked meats, to the rest of the empire. The city possessed the usual amenities we could expect of a Roman settlement, particularly an amphitheatre and a forum, as well as temples, baths and a theatre with up to 10,000 seats. Here we can see an artist's impression of Rorica at its height in AD 240, courtesy of the Augusta Rorica Museum itself. In AD 250, the town was heavily damaged by a large earthquake, and around a decade later the remainder was brought down by roving Germanic tribes. The site was eventually rebuilt in approximately AD 300 as Castrum Roricense, a military fort established close by the old settlement of Augusta Rorica and in the modern day becoming the settlement of Kaiser August. Using Google Maps, we can see here just how close the two modern settlements are. The walls of this new fortification are still partially intact, and it is a site of some historical significance as it guarded a river crossing over the Danube and into Roman Gaul, and was a meeting point for some of the forces for both Constantius II and Julian during their wars on the Alemanni tribe. As for our helmet, it was found in 1967 in the settlement of Augusta Rorica in the ruins of a block of flats. In the same context was a series of pottery fragments dated to the first half of the 3rd century. However, as Simon James points out, this was altogether in a shallow waste deposit which can only give us an earliest possible time of deposition. This is therefore no reason to associate the helmet specifically with that date instead of the 4th century military installation on the same site. Instead, the helmet is more likely to belong to the mid-4th century, a classification corroborated by similar finds of the same type across the empire. As we can see from the images, the helmet is formed of a two-part iron bowl adjoined by a central ridge and includes two cheek flaps and a neck guard, also made of iron. Around the rim of the bowl, the cheek flaps and the neck guard, we see holes indicating the presence of an interior leather lining. The central ridge is rather even, with a flat flange either side of a straight central comb held in by even and parallel rivets. Both the bowl and the cheek flaps include a cutout for the ear holes, a feature seen on other helmets of a similar type. The cheeks and neck are attached by a series of rivets as outlined here. The lack of a brow band and general outline of this helmet identifies it as an intercissor type, similar to the worm's helmet from last week. In similar fashion to the helmets found in the original intercessor horde, this helmet was not discovered along with a precious metal overlay, although, as Mix notes, there is evidence of forcible dismantling which could well indicate theft of a silver or gilt sheeting that once coated the surface, along with the beautiful repousse decorations we have come to expect. We can also see from the pictures on screen of the restored helmet that the central ridge includes a series of slots along the spine. Whilst these are only visible from the rear view, Mix notes that this is an error of the restoration and that a third slot should be present at the front, approximately as indicated here. These slots are present to make the attachment of a crest possible. 
If we look back at our video on the Nijmegen Novio Magus helmet crest, this is a feature we should expect from the metal fish fin types, although the August helmet uses slots to attach the crest to the ridge rather than the tabs and rivets of the Nijmegen Novio Magus example. Whether this implies the August example used a different type of crest, such as a wooden crest box with horsehair or feathers in, will perhaps remain a mystery. It is equally likely it was decorated with either a fish fin or something more colourful, and in this case our favourite secondary source, the artwork, is of little help, as open face helmets are depicted with both colourful crests and fish fin crests. The supplementary archaeology does, as discussed in the Nijmegen video, perhaps suggest a fish fin was more likely due to the surprising number of key row decorative plates found in the archaeological record, but again, we cannot be certain. As to why the crest would need to be removable, we can make an educated guess that the purpose is either storage and transportation, as a detached crest can be stored more easily and safely than a permanently affixed one, or perhaps for ceremonial occasions such as processions and religious events, or even a paper raid. This is simply guesswork of course. As we mentioned in the Nijmegen video, there is no way to confirm exactly when, where and why crests were worn or distributed. We can perhaps therefore guess that this helmet was worn and used by a regular legionary of some kind, with the option to add a crest to denote either a special occasion or a promotion to a more senior rank. This could be another good example therefore of the mass production capability of the late Roman army. A series of helmets created en masse with the possibility to add or remove adornments as the occasion or bearer warranted. If we assume the surface was coated with either no precious metal or in simple tinning, and the ridge was adorned with a fish fin crest, it may well have looked like this reconstruction by the Pustelak Brothers art workshop that we can see on screen now. Alternatively, had the helmet been decorated with a more expensive gilded sheeting with the necessary repousse work, it may instead have looked like the Intercessor 4 reconstruction by the same workshop we have seen so many times before and in our video last week. As the images show, Either example is a beautiful piece of equipment that any legionary would likely have been proud to wear into battle or wear while defending his fortress along the Danube. Thank you for watching, we hope you found this video interesting. Let us know of any questions you have down in the comments or any critique on how we can improve further in the coming weeks. Otherwise, feel free to check out our other videos on the channel, particularly the Nijmegen example, and we'll see you next week with another Helmet.